This is Sarah Meisel, and today we're online with Dr. Uis Baba Kamatz. He is a veterinarian working as a swine researcher with Trow Nutrition. Uis has worked with Trow Nutrition for three years, and, and part of his research is focused on Streptococcus suis. Thanks for being with us today, Uis. Hey, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Very good. Given the focus of your research, tell us a little bit about the link between such a severe disease, such as strep, and nutrition. Yeah, that's a good one. Well, this is a short answer, and this is strep is a very complex disease, and uh, without an effective or preventive solution out there in the market. So, from the nutritional standpoint, what we're trying to do is to support the beak, not preventing strep suicide itself but kind of a program type of approach to help the bake. So the longer answer is that um, strep suisse has been always there, a high prevalence, low incidence disease, um, and symptoms mostly recognized by meningitis signs, arthritis, and mortality. In the past, that used to be low incidence and low mortality, up to one or 2%. Uh, but to the date, this has increased up to 20% mortality or 30 in some outbreaks. Wow. So it happens that strep suicide is triggered by co-infections and especially PRS, which appeared from the 90s, um, has prompted a lot of those bigger outbreaks following in, in the, the past 20, 30 years. And um, not only that, co-infections, but other factors can trigger strep suicide such as poor management and general health conditions like low calistration, uh, poor ventilation and poor management of temperature. Um, we know that also post-weaning dip, diarrhea and more nutrition and E. coli uh, related problems can also um, trigger strep source. Well, what happens is that a lot of this gets covered by antibiotics and zinc oxide. And if we put that nowadays perspective, we know that, um, yeah, antibiotics are getting um, banned or reduced at uh, growth promoters as antibiotics are banned. Totally zinc oxide and therapeutic doses are gone in Europe from June this year. Uh, so all that is increasing in strep suicide and you will be doing it more. So as I said before, there are actually no alternatives in the market uh, to support that. So no vaccines, no autogenous bacterines that can really sustain an effective immune uh, response that can protect pigs after winning to the strep suicide. So basically to the date with nutrition and program management strategies, what we try and what we can do is to increase the health status and the resilience of those pigs in the critical sensitive time post winning. And actually we also demonstrated recently that with feed additives you can lower the tonsillar load, the oral cavity load of strep suicide, and all that to help um, the piglet be more resilient in that sensitive time. Very good. And what can producers look for when trying to diagnose strep? Well, strep is a uh, gram positive bacteria, lots of serotypes to 29 described, and among them, about seven are those that are most pathogenic and viral. So first things first, uh, you should know which are your, um, your important strains that are infecting your farm. And that's what I recommend the producers first. So they should rely on the vets, send the pigs out for necropsis, isolate the serotypes and strains that are most relevant for the farm. Make sure that we can discard whether it's glossarella or E. coli CGL toxin bacteria that can produce also neurological kind of clinical signs. And uh, yeah, this is what I recommend. And it is important to know that once uh, you have a type of farm with several outbreaks during the year, and those different outbreaks are diagnosed with different serotypes and different strains, those farms probably have a bigger problem than strep. And we are talking about those, um, those, vi those factors that I mentioned before that are kind of opening the opportunity so they will increase the susceptibility of pigs, biosecurity, other diseases, co-infections, management, lack of calistration, climate control, all that is going to be more meaningful for those type of farms where different strains and serotypes are causing the different outbreaks. 
On the other hand, when you have your um, strap much better characterized and you know it's your strain, then you might want to monitor saliva and tonsils over time. You might want to make sure that the strategies you want to implement to take care of that strep, like out of vaccines, like specific um, feed additives, et cetera. You want to make sure that you can monitor over time um, together with mortality, clinical signs, and, and prevalence of, of the specific strain. Very good. And, and when are pigs at the highest risk of being infected with streptococcus? Well, first, there's clearly a susceptibility window. Um, related to immunity. So we know from research that clearance of the antibodies that come from the south, so we call them maternal antibodies, right. um, they, they drop about day 18 of, of life, so before weaning, and the own self-developed antibodies of the piglets don't get there uh, produced by the pig itself until maybe two weeks, three weeks post weaning. So that window is gonna make uh, the susceptibility uh, as a first thing. Second, as I mentioned before, are co-infections that will play a role, like influenza and PRS are described to be um, very significant for strain. But then again, other uh, factors that are more related to nutrition or um, E. coli diarrhea and, and low, mm -hmm. low gut health in general can also trigger that. So keep in mind that zinc oxide and antibiotic use will play a, a key role there. And third is uh, the period of the year. So large differences between day-night temperature are associated to poor uh, management ventilation and the air quality, and those will be influencing also the strep susceptibility. Very good. Well, thank you so much for all the information today, Luis. Yeah, thank you. It was great. This is Sarah Mike so with the pig site.